bond, Putin for the Russian Federation, and Pornoshenko for Ukraine. This is billed as a Ukraine conference, but now the linkage between Syria and Ukraine is overwhelming because you've got to get Russian help into Syria to destroy ISIS, stop the civil war. Therefore, you've got to end the economic sanctions on Russia, end the economic sanctions on Syria, and then proceed to cooperate, open diplomatic relations with Assad. Merkel is now saying she needs Russia to solve the Syrian question. Merkel has now also said that Germany wants to cooperate with Assad. So cooperate, open your embassy, send weapons to Assad, help Assad, arrest the various free Syrian army terrorists on German territory while you still uh, have a chance. Um, one speculation, of course, is that the CIA response to all this is that the CIA will try to strike in southern Russia, be it Chechnya, be it uh, these other border areas in the Caucasus, Transcaucasus, North Caucasus, uh, or as we've seen uh, some city in uh, southern Russia or something of this kind, in other words, to act this uh, out. The group meeting in Paris is officially the continuation of Minsk II to oversee see the, the fulfillment of the Minsk II Accords, which on the whole have been uh, uh, successful. So this is, uh, this is going on uh, today. There, we, of course, we have to remember, right, not all rebels are supplied through Turkey. We have other groups of rebels in southern Syria. Indeed, this is where the, where the troubles began uh, that are supplied through Jordan. So don't forget Jordan. And the outlook of Jordan is not so different from the outlook of the uh, Saudi monarchy, right, based on tribes in Jordan. Now, uh, the other thing to remember, there never was a peaceful phase for the 99 millionth time. There never was this halcyon days. We're hearing about this on National Pentagon Radio this morning, NPR, the Diane Reem Show, International Radio. There never was a peaceful phase. The rebels were shooting from the first day, from the word go, going back to 1982. Back to minute. Welcome back to uh, World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in Washington. It's uh, the afternoon of uh, October 2nd, 2015. And of course, we just come from our uh, unique Welcome Putin demonstration. The Tax Wall Street Party, United Front Against Austerity, was the only organization in North America to stage a Welcome Putin greeting in Dag Hammarskjöld Plaza near the United Nations. Uh, we want to thank the Belarusian television for being there. We want to thank Press TV of Iran for being there and uh, a couple of people associated with Russia today. But we also deplore the incomprehensible uh, editorial policy of Russia today that ignored, in effect, on their air, the uh, only pro-Putin demonstration. What is wrong uh, with that um, policy? Or better, you should ask what's right with it, because it's just incomprehensible. Lots of time for Rand and Ron and Assange and Snowden, but not enough time for people who actually uh, have some positive idea of Russia. Anyway, that will not stop us. We will simply uh, escalate until some of these people um, hopefully see the light. Now, at the United Nations, a lot of stuff um, Abu Abbas, Abu Mazen of the Palestinian Authority, has said that uh, he will no longer respect the Oslo Accords of the early 1990s. Right There was that bright dawn of post-Cold War negotiations, but it's all fallen through because of people like Netanyahu and because of the assassination of Rabin. This has not um, delivered its promise, needless to say. So Abu Abbas, um, attempting to keep attention focused on the Palestinians, as it certainly deserves to be. Netanyahu's histrionics have now reached the new all-time low. His impudence, uh, but his desperation, right? The pathos and creepy quality, uh, the 45-second interval glaring at the, uh, the entire world uh, shows, I think, a political desperado who is not long for power. And remember, who subsidizes those histrionic antics and that impudence is the American taxpayer. You're paying for him to put on that show. So better this guy should go into uh, spending more time with his family. 
Um, Lavrov and Kerry uh, seem to be continuing some kind of dialogue, right? Notice we're, we're not featuring Skull and Bones Kerry on our immediate ouster list, uh, along with, uh, with Kaplan and Allen and Newland and Samantha Power, but um, where this is conditional on Kerry being reasonable. Um, Joubert, the uh, Saudi foreign minister, the guy who used to be here in Washington, right? They had sympathy gags for him. There were supposedly plots against him that were actually manufactured by the U.S. intelligence community to win him a little sympathy. Uh, Joubert says that with the Russian uh, presence in Syria, a red line has been crossed. And then the journalist said, well, what are you going to do about it, Saudi? And he said, you will see, right? Stay tuned. You will see. Uh, that's another one. There's another group that's ready to fight to the last American. Boy, they are going to be out there and aggressive and so forth. Also, domestically now, people are having a hard time adjusting to the new realities. We have Miliband of uh, one of the international charity organizations and uh, Hillary Clinton candidate saying it's time to go back to a no-fly zone. Well, guess what? Uh, the Russian forces in Syria have essentially constructed a kind of a dome, a bubble over Syria. And the idea that the Israelis or the U.S. could go in there without provoking a major armed clash, that idea is passé. There would be a major armed clash, and God knows what would turn out uh, as, as the consequence of that. So we are going to decline that. We don't want to know what the result would be. Uh, instead, uh, it's time to set up the coordination, right? There is a danger that with the U.S. and France and Russia and Britain and Syria and others, for what we know, uh, Gulf states might be there too. We just don't know. In bombing Syria, bombing ISIS and so forth, that um, – that could lead to complications. Now, there is a coordination, we're told. We're told that there's a coordination in Baghdad. There's a kind of a committee that meets there or, you know, a, a kind of a continuous consultation process. And that would be um, Iraq, Syria, Iran, and Russia. So they're coordinating. Why doesn't the U.S., why don't the British, French, and U.S. join that coordination so that you can actually conduct a war on terror. What's illegitimate? If Nusra is threatening to overthrow the uh, Assad regime, which I don't believe, but if they were, it would make, make a whole lot of sense. It would be imperative to bomb uh, the heck out of Nusra because you've got to keep the Syrian Arab army in the field, well-stocked, good morale, and fighting qualities, because they have all this. They will defend themselves, right? There's not the... This is not the Afghan army. It's not the Iraq army. This is the Syrian one, and they fight. So um, let's start uh, cooperating. Now, we're told, what's the mood in the Pentagon? We're told, first of all, that a lot of U.S. military officers are defeatist. They say, oh, gosh, we don't even know how to defeat ISIS. I'll tell you how to defeat ISIS. A thousand bomber raid in a day. You could do that, right? You, maybe you couldn't put a thousand in the air all at once, like you did at the beginning of the first Gulf War in 1991. A thousand bomber raid, clobber ISIS, uh, wipe them out. This can be done. Force Turkey to close the border uh, and cooperate with Russia, cooperate with Assad, arm Assad, dump the free Syrian army, right? Those guys are lounge lizards in the four-star hotels uh, of the Middle East. So we're told that there's defeatism. I think that defeatism is opposed, that this is simply their way of saying, you know, we're, we're, uh, you know, we're appeasers. We, we believe in the phony war. You got to get rid of officers that are sympathetic to Petraeus and Allen and this Breedlove, this, this guy. Breedlove is another person on the list of those who should be spending more time with their families. Now, we're also told that in the Pentagon and to some degree in the White House, there are people who are hoping that Putin will find a quagmire. Well, you can see he put his base in the middle of the Alawites, so no terrorists are going to have an easy time getting to the Russian base. And other than that, he's going to use air power, and the ground forces will once again be Syrian, Hezbollah, Iranian, Iraqi. 
Iraq has invited Russia to bomb ISIS in Iraq because the Allen policy of phony war and appeasement has been so wretched, so impotent and pathetic that uh, the uh, the Iraqis can see that the U.S. is not helping them in the way the U.S. obviously could. The great military establishment that rolled over Saddam Hussein in six weeks and all the rest of this stuff is now checkmated by a rabble of ragtag psychotic killers. And again, they're not even the JV. They're the intramural teams. They are a big nothing. Um Russia, uh, the, I'm sorry, National Pentagon Radio is also very unhappy with General Sisi, um, and they are really distorting the facts about this. Uh, inside the U.S., we've got a slow process of adjusting opinions to the new realities. Realistic thinking um, is creeping into the nation. They have an article about how to end the Syrian civil war, which is an extremely tentative and cautious opening to uh, to Assad. Well, we have to tell the uh, the Europeans, right, Merkel and company, uh, scream louder. Make that uh, that objection known. And please, Merkel, at least Merkel, don't sign a document saying that Russia should stop bombing the ISIS people. What is that? Or any any terrorist rebel you find. It's just just crazy. Um, but anyway, things are moving, and you can you can already see the, the outlines of a, of a new world, a, a bipolar world. Uh, and it's going to be better. Trust me, it's going to be better. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. And now we're keeping up, as always, with the Greek situation, so full of uh, lessons for what to do and what not to do. So we're very happy to be joined by our fine correspondent in Athens, and that is uh, Michael Chiotinis. Uh, so we got to get an update about what is happening now as this uh, the new government and the new ministries actually begin functioning. So, Michael, you are on the ground. Uh, tell us what's important. Yes, hello. Uh, there is an article uh, today um in the, the today's edition of Avgi, the newspaper that is friendly to the Syriza party, I found it's very interesting uh, because I read it um, an hour ago um, with the title "The Vital Lie," quote unquote "Vital Lie." It has the form, not exactly of a cultural review, rather some um, philosophical and ideological thoughts about a well-known play from the 1880s called The Wild Duck by Ibsen, Henry right. Gibson, the, the Norwegian playwright. Uh, right. The main theme of the article is to challenge the mainstream reading of the play, which is uh, that sometimes reality is unbearable and you need to have a vital lie to go on living. Um, it concludes arguing that the reverse is the case, that for a radical uh, like Ibsen, the vital lie is only useful for people and societies that don't expect anything good to come in the future. So they passively and uncomplainingly accept their fate. This article, I'm telling you this because it's quite enigmatic for me, precisely because it's written effectively in the official newspaper of Syriza. Now, is the author trying to suggest that Syriza is offering vital lies? namely that this latest deal has any chance of working, or that Syriza really can't bring something good following the mandates of the Troika, uh, or even the biggest lie of all, that Greece's EU partners will fulfill the promised debt restructuring, uh, which is already uh, debt restructuring, not, ha not a haircut. Um, or is this a critique of the society's passiveness? and the defense of uh, st strategic, the strategic path that Tsipras has chosen. I don't know. Um, all I know is that the signing of the New Deal, a week after 62% uh, of Greeks had rejected um, a new memorandum through a referendum, um, is the reason of this passiveness. Uh, now, we had... Um, there are still people in Syriza, MPs, who actually followed Tsipras and didn't go to the Popular Unity Party, who believed the theory that Tsipras was blackmailed and had to 